Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's important session on COVID 5050 women leading in crisis, particularly a gender responsive approach to health emergencies and pandemics. We're really looking forward to a lively debate. COVID-19 is changing our world profoundly. 41 million people have been infected to date and over 1 million people have lost their lives. This pandemic is far from over and for millions, uh, millions have lost their lives, but we also know that millions are facing the health, social and economic impacts of their lives will never be over. And we also know that when we look at things from a gender dimension, that sex, de de sex disaggregated data on infections and mortality is missing for many countries. The data available shows that majority of the deaths from COVID-19 are in men across all age groups, except people aged 80 and older. We also know that women may be less likely to die from COVID-19, but they face additional challenges related to policy response to the pandemic, including increased risk of intimate partner violence due to the isolation measures implemented by governments to curtail the virus, increased burden of unpaid work at home, in communities and in health systems, and the disruption to central sexual and reproductive health services. We also know that women bear the brunt of the pandemic. They make 70% of the health workforce on the front lines of patient care. They are facing a higher risk of infection than men. Women are 90% of nurses and midwives. And we also know when the pandemic broke out for the first time that 90% of the health workers in Wuhan were mainly women during COVID-19. But the contribution of women that have been made in health and social care has not earned them an equal say in decision making. Women are the majority of the health workers and the experts in the health systems. They know the best, but they only hold 25% of senior leadership roles. And this has an impact on how we respond in health security. Particularly when it comes to the COVID-19 picture, um, the numbers have been actually much worse on women's leadership and representation. Recent research from Women in Global Health has shown that 85% of the national COVID-19 task teams are comprised of majority male mem membership and less than 5% have gender parity. We know there's no shortage of expertise in women in health, um, but they're not invited into those decision-making bodies. So today's session, what we're really going to try to do is challenge um, the norms, challenge the mindset we've had, and really think about you know, women leading in crisis. What is that untapped potential? How can we do things differently? And really make a case for the fact that gender equality truly should be everyone's business because it is not only the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do, both in global health, but more widely as we are facing a global pandemic. Particularly if we had men and women equal numbers, this would have an impact in a positive manner for creating much more resilient health systems and therefore lead to better health and social well-being outcomes for all of us. So on that note, I'm really excited to introduce our panel and uh, invite my co-moderator as well, Sarah Hilwer, um, who will be co-moderating the session with me, particularly with uh, providing reflections at the closing section. Great. Chris, share the screen here. So um, I'd like to just uh, introduce Sarah Hillworth. She's our Deputy Director at Women in Global Health, and she brings uh, over 15 years of experience working in global health, particularly um, multilateral experience. And she also has worked in the front line in starting her own NGO called Girls Health Ed, uh, focusing particularly on the importance of having uh, sexual education for girls. And uh, we'll be hearing more from her throughout the session today. Um, I'd like to um, introduce next our speaker who does not need any introductions, um, uh, particularly a just sorry, I'm just having a little bit of lag here. Our first speaker is well known in global health, and I'd like to say a warm welcome to Dr. Margaret Chan. Um, she is the Emeritus Director General of the World Health Organization and President of the Global Health Forum of Bao Forum for Asia, and she's also the Dean of Vunk School of Public Health of Shunga University. Dr. Chan will speak on women in health leadership and why it matters. Our second speaker is 
Francesca Colombo, Health of, Head of the Health Division, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and will share the experience of why healthy economies require healthy girls and women. Next, we will be hearing from Professor Esther Sidera Sabino. She's the Associate Professor from the University of Sao Paulo, who will speak again on women's leadership, particularly in the science field and biomedicine. Our fourth speaker, Mr. El Hadid IC, was recently Secretary General of the International Federation of the Red Cross. Um, and uh, a Red Cross and Red Crescent and is now the chair of the board of Kofi Annan Foundation. Um, he is also a known gender champion, engaged in, gender, in many gender efforts in global health and more broadly in humanitarian. He will be speaking on women's leadership in health and drawing on his experience in humanitarian context, particularly women leading in crisis. Our fifth and final speaker today is Dr. Claire Wenman. She's an associate professor um, at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences, and she's going to be drawing on her extensive work on global health security and health emergencies. She's going to be speaking on what it means to really take a gender responsive approach to global health security. And again, a welcome to um, all of our panelists here. And they will be engaging on um, social media. So please do tag uh, World Health Summit and tag Women in Global Health and use the hashtag WGH, WHS2020. Great, so to kick us off, my first question really goes to uh, Dr. Chan. Um, Dr. Chan, you have held many senior posts um, both in your country and then served as a Director General for the World Health Organization. You have immense experience leading, but not only uh, leading in global health, you have led through multiple crises and health emergencies and you've been at the helm of exactly what it takes to lead. Um, and so I'd like to ask you a question in your leadership journey, did you face obstacles that were unique as a woman in achieving leadership positions in health? And how did you overcome them for those that are tuning in? Well, uh, thank you, Rupa. Uh, I'd like to say good day to all my panelists and particularly to my brother, Asi. Uh, welcome you to join this panel of women and being the only man. Well, Rupa, you ask a very interesting question. I think first, let me say so, I strongly support gender equity. Woman makes the society and the world better. There's no question about it. Also, let me share with you the little experience we have in a city called Hong Kong. Well, Hong Kong is part of China, but Hong Kong had three waves of COVID-19, and each and every one of those, we had success. And I don't know how much of that is due to women leadership. For those of you who are not familiar with Hong Kong, let me share with you, starting from the chief executive, she's a woman, and the minister of health is also a woman, and the director of health is also a woman. Now, how much of the success in managing the three waves in Hong Kong is due to women leadership, is for everybody else to look at the evidence and be the judge. But let's be frank, uh, my dear uh, sisters, women is an important part of the response to COVID-19. There is no question about it. And what you are saying, Rupa, is also correct. Women are not in position of decision-making or in all these high level important uh, workshops or working groups. But let's look at the contribution of women, either as a healthcare workers, either as a community workers, it's tremendous. I still remember the Wuhan response. Without the community healthcare workers, most of them are women. And without the healthcare workers, majority of them are health workers. I don't think Wuhan could have pulled off, notwithstanding uh, the response from all over the country uh, to help Wuhan. And it is a fact, and even the president, President Xi Jinping, make it a point when he was visiting Wuhan to praise uh, the leadership of the community. And of course, majority of them are women. So 
you asked me one important question. In my journey, do I, uh, you know, ch uh, meet challenges because being a woman? The answer is yes and no. Yes and no. What do I mean by that? No, if you know your business, if you're good at doing what you are doing, if you work very hard, and if you are a team player, and you, if you can communicate and listen more to your men colleagues and women colleagues, you have a much better chance to succeed. No, if you, I mean, well, many people think that women are too loud sometimes, think women are too aggressive. I'm not sure that's the case, but by being a woman, we are labeled to such an extent that sometimes it's not fair. But I am happy to see my brother Asi here. He has been very supportive of me when I was dealing with one of the big crisis, uh, Ebola outbreak in West Africa. I still remember Asi, my dear brother, he first joined uh, the organization uh, of uh, IFRC. And I still remember sharing uh, experience with him. And he was such a good listener. So being a good team player, being a good listener, being a good communicator, it can be the advantages of women, but it also can be the advantages of men. So in a nutshell, in my life, I was lucky. I was supported by, you know, women leaders, uh, women uh, workers, as well, uh, as well as by men. So to me, Yes and no. It depends on the situation, but you can make a generalization. Over to you. Great. Thank, thank you, Dr. Chan. And, um, you know, it's it's uh, the candid answer you're providing us that it's not, a, you know, clear cut. There are some things that are clearly uh, gender biases that are driving how women's leadership is perceived, but there's also a lot of value to it. And particularly this pandemic has shown us um, how women head of governments or women that have been leading the response um, have been getting more recognition. And uh, it's great to hear that there's much more recognition that's happening when it comes to frontline women. So particularly, um, you know, the Southeast Asia is one where women's uh, leadership has been lagging significantly. When we've um, done breakdowns of country delegate member state delegations to the World Health Assembly. We notice um, the Western Pacific area, the Southeast Asian area, and the Eastern Mediterranean area lagging the most. Um, but particularly, we do know women are leading there in the front lines. What advice would you give men in this region about including women in leadership um, and decision-making bodies? Well, for women, I think we need to be a bit more humble. Um, it's no secret that we are still living in a man's world. I mean, that is a fact. By being humble, uh, a woman can cry. A woman can use her um, uh, attributes to an advantage. I mean, for me, I cry most of the time when I feel sad, when I you know, feel that I am being bullied, and when I feel that I'm being unfairly treated, but it's okay for a woman to show that, but it is not seen as a sign of weakness. But on the other hand, if a man is crying because of whatever reason, it would be seen as a, a sign of weakness. So in that respect, as a woman, we need to work hard, as I said, there is no replacement of hard working and knowing your business. But then on the other hand, please use the woman's attribute to your advantage. So that is, a, I have to say, a bit, bit surprising uh, type of advice there, really around, uh, you know, almost embracing the gender, uh, gender, uh, gendered aspects to leadership and saying using them to, to an advantage. But Dr. Chen, you are one of the most strategic leaders, uh, leaders there. So I think there is a lot to take in with that advice. 
Um, and I'd actually like to jump to IC. I know IC, um, we were going to have you speak a little bit later, but I think there's just the dynamics of both Dr. Chan and you have uh, worked together in previous um, health emergencies and particularly the Ebola outbreak. Um, I'd like to turn to you and, you know, just sort of ask you, what are your uh, sort of response and reflections to something that, you know, Dr. Chan is really talking about the different leadership styles between men and women and, and how do we embrace them in, in a pandemic response? I see we're not able to hear you. I see. I see you may have to turn off mute. Thank you very much. I was uh, struggling a little bit. Uh, with, uh, I cannot hide, uh, you will allow me, I can't hide my pleasure and pride to share the panel with all of you, but particularly with my sister and friend, Margaret. And, um, you know, what she says uh, very shortly, you know, hides much, much depth. Yes, Margaret, you can be humble without being weak. You know, you can be firm without being aggressive. You can lead without being arrogant. And all those are values that are extremely important and reflect, you know, the importance, you know, of the themes, you know, that we are talking about. We often have to translate that, you know, in situations where needs are greatest, where vulnerabilities are most exacerbated, where risks, you know, are the norm of the day. And those are situations that are not normal. And we nicely call them humanitarian settings and humanitarian situations. And there is a places, you know, where human dignity is eroded, you know, by the day. It is a place you know, where you know, people start every morning to develop strategies of survival and those strategies of survival will put them again at the highest risk. A walk you know, to a water point can become a matter of life and death. Fetching wood you know, for energy you know, can be the highest risk that one can face. So if I take those two examples, you can understand that we are not all equal in facing those challenges, because those are particular activities you know, that are devoted to women. And that's the reason why we often say women are disproportionately affected in those settings. But it will be a mistake to think that they are only passive victims, but they are actors, active you know, ones that are the forefront of the response. They are the ones who are caring for the children at home. They are the ones caring for the sick. They are the ones also as active members of the humanitarian response, you know, that we see. In a, norm, in a situation that is not normal, of course, you know, we think of what we believe, you know, are the most important packages, you know, that would be saving lives and elevating human suffering. Food, of course, water, sanitation, hygiene, and, Maybe the most important part you know, will come as an afterthought, which is protection. If it comes as an afterthought, it is going to be too late for too many, right from the beginning, to take into account you know, the need for women to be protected against gender-based violence, to start right from the start to ensure you know, that they are safe, you know, right from the start you know, to ensure that they are not the problem, but really a part of the solution, you know, that we would like to see. And that is the reason why it is important that those perspectives you know, are integrated you know, in the design, in the implementation, as well as in the evaluations you know, of the humanitarian and development programs, you know, that we are seeing. And in that context, as Margaret was alluding to, you know, leadership is critical. And well, people are asking for the evidence. I don't know the evidence, but if what we say something look like a duck, quack like a duck, maybe it's a duck. You know, if we see, you know, a women leadership making a difference, you know, in New Zealand, well, it may mean something. If the examples of Hong Kong, you know, can be so inspiring, as well as also the community response in one, then it may mean something. If in Germany right now, where we are having the World Humanitarian Summit, the women leadership is making a difference, then I think we can get inspiration, you know, from that, you know, the making sure 
you know, that all those hypotheses, you know, that we'll be struggling, you know, around with, you know, that indicate, you know, something very important that we need to take into account in the design and implementation you know, of our response. Thanks for now and maybe more later. Yes, and uh, thank you, um, I see to really just highlighting. If we're seeing uh, the narratives around us, the antidotes, we can, you know, at some point we just no longer can ignore those antidotes, and we should start viewing them as as evidence. And so I'd like to actually turn to Francesca, um, who's uh, joining us from OECD. Um, OECD has been uh, for some time very converted on the gender equality agenda, and particularly looking at it from an economic development perspective. So I'd like to ask you, can you give us examples of how greater gender equality between women and men and boys and girls support stronger and more secure economies. Clearly, as we've been responding to the pandemic, are we not only thinking about the public health response, but we're also thinking about the economic vulnerabilities it's set up for all genders? Sure, thank you very much, Rupa, and very delighted to, to be here today in such a, a distinguished uh, uh, panel with uh, guests which have really led the way on issues related to gender equality. Um, my main point that I would like to make is that the issues of gender equality and all the efforts that we're um, making to try to achieve this goal, it's clearly not just important from a human uh, perspective, but actually there are very, very, very strong economic rationals. And gender equality is really something which is essential also in economic terms. Um, and if we look at many crises, I mean, obviously the COVID-19 crisis, uh, which will have a huge toll on, on society, uh, which affects very much the health workers and the, the majority of which are women, as it was mentioned um, at the beginning of, of this panel. And then we say a few words more about the COVID-19. But in any crisis that we have, if we want to come out in a sustainable way from any crisis that we have, it's very, very simple, the response. We need to be able to make use and good use of any possible human talent, which is available wherever this is available. So it's really a matter of not wasting really that human talent and leveraging that for the economic response, which is so crucial and where we do see that we have not managed to reach the level of, uh, of equality or being quite quite there in uh, creating the economic conditions for a much more prosperous um, and equitable equitable economy and and society and so you know whether you talk about crisis related to covid 19 or population aging uh, or issues even relative to mass youth employment or even if you think of the pressure that you have on the on the environment, you need to find solutions for those challenges. And for those solutions, you need to have the best possible uh, human capital that you have. Now, that's the it's a very simple uh, economic rationale that you have. The reality, of course, is that we are not quite there yet. I mean, there have been progress um, even prior to, to the current crisis. Uh, think about uh, in terms of bringing more women to higher level of education. The progress has been immense and there are actually more women that graduate uh, right now compared, compared to men. Now this has over the decades translated in a significant impetus for economic growth. And so these greater education uh, attainments that we have seen across the world, much of which has been driven by bringing more girls into higher level of education has really accounted for about half of that economic growth. And so when you're looking about the importance of making sure that you have equity in education, making sure that uh, girls are educated, for example, this is precisely to be able to uh, leverage that human capital for growth and development for the whole economy moving uh, forward. And so the reality though, is that even if we have many more women who are graduating now from university, there is still a significant gaps um, in terms of uh, labor market participations, in terms especially on labor market outcomes, be it, for example, in terms of uh, wages, be it in terms of uh, holding positions of responsibilities, of being also in, uh, um, in the boards, uh, boards uh, having seats in, uh, in boards where decisions are making. And, uh, you know, we also spend fewer hours in paid work throughout their life course, um, partly because they have 
caring responsibilities for children, but later on also for um, for their older parents. And this means that throughout that life course, uh, individuals uh, earn less, uh, women learn uh, less, they build up less rights for them pension, and they end up with a higher prob uh, probability of uh, linking in, uh, um, living in poverty. And so all these things are very much linked because if you don't have, if you don't create the condition for women to earn on similar ways and to participate on similar grounds in the labor market, then you have lower pension, pensions, as you have, as I mentioned, it creates more financial um, insecurity and financial burden, and you have more women actually that um, end up living in poverty. So there is a process of uh, unequal, uh, even in, in aging, which um, uh, those inequalities are particularly um, a burden for, for women. Now, in times of crisis, obviously, uh, women can be uh, a solutions. They can be a solutions by leveraging the human capital pro provided. Obviously, we are able to address those, uh, uh, those conditions. Now, if we look specifically at the, at the COVID-19 crisis, it's quite clear that gender gaps persists, and some of which, uh, Rupa, you mentioned at the very, very much beginning, in terms of how jobs, uh, in terms of caring responsibilities, Yes, women make 70% of the health workforce. They are therefore more exposed also to infections. They are underrepresented in leadership positions in the healthcare sectors. They have a much greater um, responsibility for caring for elderly people. 90% of the long-term care workers uh, across UC countries uh, you know, are, are, are women. And if we look even in the health workforce uh, itself, uh, uh, there is an overwhelming representation of women in nurses and midwifery um, type of, uh, of jobs. There are also, I would say, women perhaps uh, slightly less represented even in, in, in the media, uh, in the debates. Uh, that's something that could be worked on. But I think there are other aspects uh, of these gender inequalities in the COVID-19 crisis, which have to do with women's employment and income as well. Now, if we look at past crises, uh, for example, if we look at the 2008 crisis, uh, there were more men certainly that lost their job. But when then we had the recovery phase, uh, men employment improved much more quickly than what happened for women employment. And uh, even if we look at the Ebola crisis, women did suffer more also from an employment perspective because they tend to be employed in jobs like retail trade, hospitality and tourism, which were more hardly hit from the contractions. And the same is what we're gonna most likely see in the current context, that actually women uh, tend to uh, be more employed in jobs, and this is beyond the health sectors, in industry which are directly more impacted by, by the crisis, such as tourism, retail, um, and, and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Francesca, you know, just kind of building on what you're what you're saying there, you've made the case very clear that women are the shock absorbers of society. Not only do they carry a burden of unpaid work, um, but they also are carrying um, the balancing act, the possible balancing act of paid and unpaid, and are really highlighting some of those economic dimensions. Uh, particularly relevant for the health sector is uh, the point that you said that yes, women make up 70% of the health workforce, but half of what women are doing in this health sector continues to remain in the unpaid informal, which amounts to almost 1.5 trillion US dollars annually. So just again, you know, chiming in on the work of OECD um, to really make that economic case, how does OECD currently work with its members to support gender equality? And how is it working in COVID-19 um, to really mitigate some of these effects that we are seeing predictions of almost 100 people, 100 million people entering into extreme poverty as uh, some of the examples. And we also know that, you know, in, in global health, we've made uh, a very large political commitment um, to have universal health coverage that was just passed um, at the high level political forum at the UNGA in the fall of 2019. So in the context, we have a very ambitious health agenda, yet we know that the pandemic is 
uh, resulting in people lo losing their jobs, entering into um, extreme poverty. And we know that health and economic aspects are quite uh, interconnected. So what, what are some of the top level things that OECD is doing to um, support gender equality and um, address some of those economic aspects, especially during COVID-19? So I think it's uh, it's not just especially doing, I think it's something that's uh, um, pre-existed with even COVID-19 because I think some of the root uh, causes of uh, gender inequalities are not linked to the COVID-19 crisis as well. And so it has been working for many, many years to try to address those root causes. And so, for example, the work of the OECD on the gender initiative started already in, in 2010. Um, we had in 2012 something called the All on Board for Inclusive Growth uh, Initiatives. We had uh, a bit later, um, 2013 and 15, I think two OECD Council recommendations. So these are non-binding soft laws, but very much with a, a strong legal a strong moral force because those are things that all the countries of OECD as well as other adherents commit to and we had two of those one of gender recommendations we looked at, at recommendation for more uh, equality in employment education entrepreneurship uh, as well of uh, women and also for gender recommendations in public life so how to promote more more equality in public life in politics as well um, in the public sectors and support. Now, what we do is that we monitor the progress the countries have been doing uh, in, against those commitments that they did uh, take. And we do that on a, on a regular basis. Obviously, we do a lot of data, a lot of uh, you know, economic analysis as well. We have also been very much at the forefront of uh, uh, working with G20 countries on the G20 gender targets. Um, so we are also helping define those uh, targets and uh, right now I'm monitoring uh, every year what has been the progress uh, in these respects. And perhaps the last things I can mention is that uh, the, an initiative uh, that we have set up together with the ILO and UN Women, which is called Equal, Equal Pay um, International uh, Coalition, which is really looking at trying to address the, uh, the gap in gender pay um, and reach, you know, you know, help to reach uh, the, the sustainable development goals and important sustainable de development goals. In I would say that, you know, what OECD response you know, is much broader than just considering the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. We are continuing, we are monitoring, and we had also done analysis on the effects specific of this crisis on, uh, on gender. I think there are the immediate effects, but what worries us is more how this will create um, also perpetuate some of the pre-existing uh, difficulties and inequalities and make the achievements of goals more difficult. So yeah. Do crack, yeah. Great. Thank, th thank you, Francesca. And, you know, just again, um, you know, clear message there that OECD has been on the agenda of addressing gender equality and uh, making sure that the long-term economic empowerment of women um, has been uh, part of part of the work that's been ongoing. I'd actually like to turn um, back to Dr. Chan. You know, there was something that uh, Francesca said at the tail end that you know there are there are, there is worry that you know this pandemic might set back the sustainable development goal agenda. And you know, in, in your leadership, you were uh, really driving the sustainable development goals, especially from the health lens, but also just um, really making sure that health was part of all the other goals too. What are your thoughts on what can we do to not have setbacks um, on the health agenda and the gender equality agenda? Thank you. Um, truly, I fully agree with uh, what uh, Francesco said. If you look at the data coming from a report from the World Health Organization in August, not just, you know, um, um, COVID-19 is important. All the other important diseases like NCD, family planning, immunization, uh, HIV, AIDS, TB and malaria, 70 to some 40% of the services were canceled because the healthcare workers were deployed to manage the COVID-19 crisis. Now, I'm not saying that they should not do that, but let us not forget, let us not forget 
the millions of people who are suffering from all these diseases, they suffer as well. Not that they suffer from COVID-19, but they suffer from the lack of care. So for me, in the post-COVID-19 era, it is very important that we redouble our efforts to make sure that our health system uh, is resilient enough and we will do the catching up game to make sure the people who suffer the most get the care they need. Now, whether or not we have this sense of urgency, uh, this, this sense of great need to make the catching up uh, is a matter to be seen because as we are speaking, COVID-19 is still raging around the world and it is making a very strong comeback in uh, Europe, uh, in uh, the US and in other parts of the world. So I did say on one occasion at another uh, forum, whether you like it or not, in order to have economic revival, in, you need activities. For activities, people need to feel safe and secure before they dare to go out. Because self-imposed avoidance behavior is the strongest driver to contract economy. So in China, why they are successful with the economic comeback is because in February, starting in February of this year, after they managed to the, uh, contain the um, outbreak in Wuhan, and they are much more manageable in the sense they already instituted a policy. The policy is a two-prong approach. The first prong is you must keep your eyes on the ball, meaning COVID-19, maintain your vigilance and be ready uh, with your experience to pounce on any cluster, any resurgence. The second prong is to make an orderly recovery. Recovery in uh, the factories, in the schools, in the uh, business world and so on. So that's why there are already some people saying is China overdoing all this testing? Well, it is a judgment call to China. They would. The latest example I can share with you is in Qingdao. In Qingdao, they have about oh, less than 20 cases. And yet they tested almost 10 million people of the entire city population. Yes, it's costly, it is disruptive, but it gives the level of confidence to people so that they can get back to business, they can get back to uh, uh, you know, a normal life. So at the end of the day, we need to look at the evidence. What is important for your context? Contextual factor is extremely important. The culture, the system, which include not just the health system, the political system and other dimensions when you are making the decision. Over. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Chan. And, you know, I think a clear message there about also just uh, having a formal economic response. We know that uh, half of what women do in the health sector continues to be in the informal unpaid. So there is also need to use the evidence there to convert into formal jobs. I will be coming back to you to comment a little bit um, later in the panel on what, you know, how can we get political leadership to really act on formalizing women's contributions in the health sector. Um, on that note, I'd like to turn it actually um, to another aspect of the COVID-19 response. We know that uh, not only are women working at the front line, um, and we also know that there is immense amount of research that women are doing in um, COVID-19 and even before in uh, health emergencies and really, uh, you know, want to show that, you know, that 
not only are, are women uh, working in this space um, from a healthcare perspective, but they're also designing some of the technical solutions as well. So on that note, I'd like to invite Professor Esta um, uh, Saradira Sabino. Um, Esther, particularly, you've talked a lot about, you know, how in Brazil, there are many women in science and that are designing the solutions, uh, but we still know that as far as uh, having women in decision making, there continues to be um, some challenges. So can you share with us what are some realities that we're seeing in Brazil, particularly when it comes to women's leadership in the academic and science field? Okay, thank you. I, yes, I, the, doing science in countries like Brazil that doesn't have this like long term experience and we're slow getting more and more people in, in, in working in this area. Uh, women went through almost nobody in the early half of, part of last century and slowly we grow the number of women working. And uh, Actually, because in part nowadays, it's not a well-paid area of the economy. So today, like in the biomedical science, there is more than around 70% of the graduate students are women in Brazil. And even in the post-graduation courses, it's like 55 to 60%. So it's a slow process, but still, when you go into the higher level of academic, then the proportion of women are much lower. It's like in my university, there was ever only one women dean in 80 years of the university. In my medical school, no women was a director of the institute. So it's a slow process. Though the women are getting more and more in the basic levels of academy, it hasn't yet reached that. So now for response for a COVID-19, what you need when you want to respond to an epidemic, you need preparation before the epidemic. So someone who has a network, a long-term work systematically, and you need the networking, international network and local network. So in this sense, it's like to detect the virus, to understand how it, the epidemic is growing, or even trying to develop diagnostic tools. So if you don't have this before, you won't be able to do during an epidemic. So it's preparedness and it's how much you, how many people you have doing uh, science that will allow you to respond. So in this sense, because the majority are women and because slowly women are, are taking the leadership, you did have a lot, many network uh, leaded by, by women. But still, it's a long way to go. So I think uh, one important thing is that respond, respond in detecting an epidemic that can't be just, you need people everywhere to be able to detect a new epidemic and to detect uh, a new virus or that you need to have a response. If you don't have people everywhere, you don't have uh, no science anywhere. So even if you have a really developed science, in some parts of the world, you won't be able to contain the epidemic. And so, um, so, yep, and it sounds like Esther, what you're saying is that we need to use 100% of our talent pool and especially during, during a pandemic. Can you share with us a little bit about what benefits have you been seeing with having women engaged in science? What, what are some of the benefits that you've noticed? So the first thing you double your capacity if you don't have women working also. And, uh, I think it's a different eye. I mean, it's the eye of being slow, being prepared, being uh, systematic in the way you do your work. And I, I think this is key things for, for this response. If you don't prepare everything, if you don't look at the details, if you don't uh, think of each step of how you respond, you are not going to be able to, be, to respond quickly. So I think this is important in, in the science, in preparing the scientific world in countries like Brazil to respond to an epidemic. And you need those force everywhere. You can't just have it uh, in, in, in Europe or US or in China or whatever. You need it everywhere in all countries to be able to respond globally. Great, so really clear message there, Esther, on your end that 
particularly it's also about uh, being comprehensive, um, have being very holistic in, in, in that style and being very detail oriented. So the technical expertise that women are bringing that are um, uh, contributing to the response uh, is, is critical. And so, and it's a unique gendered style that you're, you're picking up on. And one of the questions we're getting from our audience members is that we've been talking a lot about the problems and the barriers. And of course, you know, we know that the landscape of achieving gender equality current estimates are it's going to take us at least 100 years before we achieve gender equality. So we know that the, the barriers and problems are immense, but want to turn it, you know, the conversation a little bit more towards the solution aspect. What do you think would help supporting women into leadership um, in your context, Esther? I think those networks that uh, since Ebola crisis, there were uh, many groups were created in an international contest to improve the response. So those interventions, if they also push to have more women working in the network or trying to put the same number of women, that will help because it's the preparedness that will allow women to, to respond. So to respond in the epidemic. So if during, before the epidemic, so and inter the epidemics, if you do manage to get uh, like focus on putting more women in, in this, this role, then you certainly will have more women and work into the next epidemic. So I think this, this, this international uh, approach that is extremely needed, we need to train more scientists everywhere to be able to respond, then, then uh, putting, and putting as uh, women, you need to have equal number of women being trained, that's what is gonna change. I think more quickly. Great, thank, thank you, Esther. So really a power of networks there and um, continuing to invest in uh, developing the talent pipeline as, as two clear solutions. Um, I'd like to actually turn uh, to uh, IC again. And you know what I'd like to begin with is uh, we, we have a question coming from the audience and it's building on really, you know what difference does it make to have equal numbers of women in leadership in humanitarian settings and emergencies? And how do you see that when it comes to leadership styles? Uh, and and there's a question from the audience that is specifically asking what aspects of the male style of leadership can be potentially detrimental to managing a crisis, a pandemic? Well, I, I think the oh, Esther, it's going to be uh, I see, but I can come back to you after okay. um, the next speaker. Thank you. Well, first of all, I think uh, for me, my perspective was really one of uh, equity, one of uh, fairness, and one of uh, inclusion. So in, uh, if you simply forget half of the humanity, well, you will do something bad you know, to humanity. Uh, for me, that is you know, it's just simple to start with. On the other hand, you know, we cannot keep on, uh, for example, in the humanitarian setting, talk about one particular group of humanity being disproportionately affected. And then when it comes you know, to the response, you do not you know, integrate in all sense you know, of the word, you know, not only the perspective, but the physical presence at all levels, including at the leadership level to you know, make a difference. So we have seen where it is happening, it will make a difference from an empiric observation and an evidence. So it is the right thing to do in practice. It is the right thing to do in values. It is the right thing you know, to do. Now simply, full stop. Now, in practice, you know, what we are seeing, and Margaret reloaded to that you know, very clearly, we've seen uh, you know, uh, differences you know, in leadership style. And she put it very nicely. You, know, you, you can be humble, does not mean you are weak. I think you know the lack of weakness, you know, that is covered in humility, you know, can open doors, you know, can also engage people, that can also you know take people on the same path, you know, because there is no point of leading and being there alone, you know, without driving people, you know, on the same level of engagement, and that kind of leadership is extremely important. So she said, and I repeat it uh, at the beginning, you can be very firm but not be arrogant, not at the same time. So if you are arrogant, then you alienate people. And again, you know, you not only leave them behind, but completely 
you know, in the margin, and there you stand alone, you know, there what you see. At times when we need more than ever before inclusion, at times where we need, you know, more than ever before solidarity, at times where we need more than ever before compassion, care, and support, that is the kind of leadership, of course, you know, that is, we see so in women that it is. So, what is the uh, detrimental you know, style that we see in you know, male leadership? Well, I'm not so categoric like you know, the person who was putting the answer. For me, I don't think there's one specific male specific leadership and another specific you know, women one. I think that there are characteristics you know, across the board you know, of leadership that if they're applied by men and by women, you know, then it will make a difference in the positive sense. And if not, you know, it would cause a problem. Now, I don't think, you know, that uh, men are unable, you know, to have, you know, that kind of a leadership. They should be aware, you know, of that and simply, you know, do, do the needful and not to each of us, you know, being entrenched either in our gender or our identity and not being able to change. Well, if we can't, then we will not be leaders, regardless, you know, who we are. So I think, again, let's come back, you know, to values that will make, you know, true leadership of caring, of supporting, empowering, solidarity, and engaging people on the same path and not leaving them, you know, behind. And that, I think, you know, uh, is valuable for men and, and women altogether. And uh, I see, not, not to put you on the spot, but I am going to a little bit. Uh, I wanted to say this particular point that you're saying about leadership style, and you know, we've heard Dr. Chan um, really emphasize this as well. Are we seeing that leadership styles are now going to be con considered part of the recommendations on how the humanitarian response should be? Um, you know, there's definitely several, um, you know, convening bodies that you've uh, been a part of, you've been co-chairing that make recommendations on health emergencies and pandemic response, um, is leadership style now going to be uh, much more uh, apparent since um, this pandemic has clearly highlighted why leadership matters so much and, and the style of leadership? So the, the, this pandemic is indeed a revealer of some of the dysfunctionalities that we're seeing. Leadership has always been very important, but now it shows you know, that it is extremely important. We need a engaged, inspiring, and caring, you know, leadership that is really required. So the world is crying for that, you know, right now. And, you know, let me say, we have some of it, we don't have enough of it. You know, we need the critical mass of leaders that should engage you know, in that path and then take citizen along. There will be, you know, no trust in leadership if there is no accountability. So many promises made, so many promises broken. And that is totally unacceptable. There will be no leadership that is sustainable if there is no engaged citizenship. We cannot, you know, let our fate you know, in the hands of whoever considers you know, to be leader. Citizens must also be engaged, you know, hold leaders, you know, to account for. And we all together, you know, in the different settings where we work in the international arena, including in the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, we are also holding leaders, you know, to account you know, to do the needful, you know, for their people. And no leaders, no matter now where you are, be it in a rich country or in a poor country, nobody should be left off the hook. You know, people must deliver and deliver for people. And we must also deliver for the sake of the one and only humanity we all belong to. Great, great, I see. I think thank you for answering that. And I'll be coming back to you to get some reflections on, you know, what type of uh, political leadership will it take to get the gender parity commitments made as well? Because there's clearly a, a gendered aspect to leadership, um, and women not being at the decision making table does influence the fact that some of these uh, feminine traits um, are are not, you know, being embraced as much. Uh, and we know when there's diversity in in um, a decision making, not just diversity based on gender but geography, uh, multiple discipline, uh, disciplines, intergenerational leads to much more uh, better understanding of problems, more sustainable 
solution. So I'd like to, you know, come back to you in a moment um, to reflect a little bit on what can we do to get much more diversity into decision making? Like, you know, what's that political leadership look like? So I'll be coming back to you in a moment, but I'd like to actually, um, you know, turn to uh, Dr. Claire Wenman. And Claire, um, this is a field that you have been uh, dedicating a very long time of your research focuses really on health security, but more importantly, on gender responsive health security. You know, can you share a little bit with us on, you know, what it is that it would really take in your perspective to have women in equal numbers when it comes to decision making roles? Um, we've clearly heard lots of numbers today about the fact that when you map 115 um, COVID-19 task teams and advisory groups from 87 countries, 85% of those are majority men. Um, so very far from gender balance. What, what do you think it would take and what are some recommendations really from the academic perspective um, that you'd like to share with us? Thanks, Rupert, and thank you so much for having me this morning on this panel. It's a delight to be here and listen to all these perspectives. Um, as you said, this is something we've been researching for a long time, looking at how outbreaks affect women and men differently, and how that and how that you know is manifested by the policy decisions that are made. And I think it's firstly important to say that this isn't necessarily new. We saw this exact same thing occur during the, the Ebola outbreak. You know, we saw women who weren't in decision-making roles, uh, obviously with the exception of, of Dr. Chan. Um, but, uh, you know, through all the, all the levels of governance, we didn't see women taking that role. Now in Zika, we saw something quite similar, which was a lot of the women, uh, as, as Esther talked about, we saw a lot of leading female scientists in Brazil doing a lot of the groundbreaking research on, on Zika, on congenital Zika syndrome, and really driving the agenda. But then that wasn't translated into women, into female leadership decision making, and indeed on policies which impacted women in a in in a way which led to you know less uh, inequalities being produced. And so here's the real clinch: the, the problem that we see is that the policies that are designed to respond to outbreaks don't recognise that every case is a person and every person is different, and men and women are different. And we need to move away from thinking purely in epidemiological case data into recognizing that men and women experience outbreaks differently. And therefore, we need to create much more inclusive policy, which recognizes those differences and recognizes that decisions affect, you know, policy decisions affect men and women differently. And so whilst I think that, and as the, your work in Women in Global Health has shown, you know, gender representation and gender parity on all task force is important for the sake of gender parity, and that's a, you know, a universal truism. But I think it's important to recognize that gender inclusive policymaking doesn't come from representation alone, right? Just being a woman doesn't mean you understand all those gender effects. And so alongside gender parity in these decision-making bodies, we also need to push for gender advisors, right? And making sure we get the expertise of people who really understand gender impacts in the room where these decisions are being made. You know, we have gender advisors on climate change panels. We have gender advisors in humanitarian panels and decision-making. So why aren't we seeing that same level of, of gender advice going into decisions around how outbreaks are made? And so we really need to push governments and push institutions to, to really include that knowledge because it's through that type of expertise that you're going to see policy becoming more inclusive as well and making sure that people do recognize, you know, the economic effects that Francesca was talking about, the impacts that we see on, um, uh, on uh, maternal health. I mean, we're seeing shocking rates at the moment of maternal mortality going up as a consequence of, of diverting the action. Now, you need to have someone who can preempt these things and therefore create policy which reduces or mitigates against some of these trends. And so I think we really need to kind of, we need to push for that type of recognition in panels. And I think part of that is also, it's not just about, um, you know, having the right people in the room, but it's about the structures of how these people get in the room. And we can look at institutions and we can see great work happening across the board in global health at the moment with, you know, gender strategies and trying to become more representative. And I think that's a, a, a great, uh, you know, we should applaud all institutions for doing that. But we also need to recognize the informal structures that go along within these organizations as well, which might prohibit women's participation or prohibit gender advice going in, which is, you know, have we, have we made sure the informal processes, you know, the, 
the the way we work, the way that decisions are made, you know, are all decisions made at, at happy hour after, you know, after work's done for the day, which women don't take part in because they tend to go home for, for childcare. Right? You know, we need to make sure that the way we make decisions, the processes by which sins are made are also reflective. And so I'd call for a much more inclusive way of thinking about gender through all parts of how we respond to outbreaks, both in preparedness, decision-making, and indeed the response. Great, and uh, yeah. you know, I really appreciate that you highlighted the point that uh, having women by default does not mean that we have a gender responsive approach, that we actually need to have gender expertise to really have a gender responsive approach. And that truly has health implications. Um, can you build a little bit more on what does that exactly mean? You, you know, talked a little bit about, um, we know that there are, are uh, gender-based health implications, but what does it mean to be gender responsive in global health security? So I think it's about just reflipping the conversation and deciding what's important in our policy making. So, you know, you might think that a response to an outbreak such as COVID or any other epidemic, you know, if the main goal is ending the outbreak, absolutely it should be. But you shouldn't end the outbreak at a cost of everything else, right? And so whether that's a cost of seeing surging rates of increasing, uh, you know, cancer mortality, which is now what we're seeing in Europe, for example, or other distortions to the health agenda. It's also recognizing that, you know, the, the cost of ending the outbreak shouldn't be women's economic participation or, or maternal mortality. And so how do we, when we think about policy making and start either creating policy or improving or developing policy, where do we put women in our decision making and our thinking around that? So instead of simply being end cases, how do we say end cases and ensure that women are disproportionately affected? Right, and try and do both those things and put women at the center of how you design your policy. So that might mean that you know, in preparedness phases, you might start thinking about, okay, well, how would women respond to surveillance different to men? How would women respond to risk communication different to men? How do we build that into how we create our preparedness plans? How do we build um, response to outbreaks in a way which, you know, protects childcare because we know that childcare is the building block to women's economic participation, for example. How do we ring fence all maternal health services from distorted health agendas during pandemics so that we protect women's access to antenatal care, which we know is a, you know, a key tool for reducing maternal mortality? And how can we somehow just make these processes by which we respond to outbreaks a lot more cognizant of the differential effects that outbreaks and response policies have on men and women. And it doesn't take innovation, it doesn't take you know, great science, it just takes thinking slightly out of the box and asking that question of where are the women at all stages of your policy making. And so it's not, it's not a big ask, I don't think. I think it's just changing the way you think slightly and, and making sure those questions are asked. Great, thanks for that very practical breakdown. And I actually wanna turn it back to uh, I see who's actually seen this play in and out in his previous leadership roles. And um, I see in many humanitarian settings, we're seeing a significant gender imbalance in COVID-19 infections with over 80% of the infections reported in men. Um, how far, uh, you know, really taking Claire's question there, you know, if we look at this with, you know, how are women intersecting with testing in humanitarian settings? Um, what would you say about that particular data point? Like how far can women in humanitarian settings access testing in health services? Let's, let's test this theory out that Claire just gave us about putting it into the perspective um, of a woman trying to intersect with testing in humanitarian settings. So I see to you. Well, I think Claire answered that, you know, partly because, uh, you know, women care for the sick, you know, they are also on the front line, but they often do not access services, you know, for themselves. And that is uh, related also if the environment enabling for that, you know, is the services, you know, appropriate, you know, for those women in geography and in time, you know, to be accessed. And also in the social contracts, you know, around it, you know, supportive enough. I think those are the questions that we may ask ourselves. But she says also something extremely important. It is, you know, we may see that uh, there are more men, you know, affected, partly related to access to testing, but also 
maybe to the profile of this particular pandemic because of the comorbidities that goes you know, with it. But there are also the other part, which is the indirect you know, effect you know, of this pandemic, you know, maternal mortality, who's affecting so women, gender-based violence you know, in times of COVID, in times of emergency, the whole protection agenda you know, that goes with it, sexual and reproductive health services, you know, and the list you know, goes on and on and on. And if we do the maths you know, at the end, when the dust settles, you will maybe see you know, more casualties and a more negative impact on those areas than the direct you know, one that's related to of being infected you know, by COVID and you know, falling sick. You know, of it. So we need to look at it you know, in the broad you know, sense and broad perspective, both in, the terms of, in terms of the pandemic as well as in the humanitarian you know, settings you know, that we are working in. And we cannot uh, dissect and then segment you know, response that is going to be a vertical one, you know, in a context that requires a more vertical, integrated, you know, type of response that we would like to see. And that, you know, too much, you know, too often, you know, in the past we made those mistakes. And I think it is time, you know, to learn from that you know, and apply the right strategy. And that's the reason why I was talking about protection not being an afterthought. It should be there right from the beginning. And safety of women and girls and children in those settings, you know, should be there right from the start. Great, thank, thank you. I see. Um, I, I see, uh, Dr. Chan. Um, please, uh, uh, floor is yours. Yes, I, I like to jump in to supplement what uh, I see said, because we are seeing another crisis supplementing or following the COVID nineteen. We are seeing trafficking of children, many, uh, much more. We are seeing higher prostitution rate. Now, this is the problem. When we, you know, I fully agree with Claire. When we make the uh, COVID nineteen response, we also need to think of who are the groups of people that will be affected because the family is out of job. So, so you, your safety net need to balance that dimension. You don't just hand out uh, money to anybody. You should be very targeted and based on your prior knowledge that who are the groups of women, most likely, children, and also the elderly. So that's why uh, your targeted approach to make sure that your resources is well used as a safety net is important. That is the, uh, you know, part of the policy making in terms of the COVID-19 response, not just dealing with COVID-19, but all the consequences coming from COVID-19. Over. Thank you, doc Dr. Chan. And, you know, I'd like to actually turn to Francesca to also respond, you know, as um, we are defining gender responsive health security, and as we've heard from IC and Dr. Chan about how it's also intersectorial, it's now, you know, we can't only look at gender responsive health security from a health lens, but it's also very interconnected to other social protections. Um, I'd like to give you a chance to reflect to um, as we define gender responsive health security. Sure, and precisely what you said is the interconnections with more broadly social protection, which uh, I think is important. As much as you need to have things which are very specific also to this crisis, you need to uh, make sure that you leverage and you build up, and obviously some countries uh, have stronger than others, that uh, response from uh, uh, you know the safety net, the social protection system and support. And so, for example, you need, of course, to support women, uh, workers and families in their caring responsibilities and things like uh, facilitating more flexible work arrangements, uh, even leave because there is a, you know, the need for, for, for caring or facilitating uh, teleworking, uh, that balance between the, the, the work and caring responsibilities is fundamental because it enables the continuation of the participations. Um, of women in the labor markets in moments in which the crisis is very much affecting economies and societies, or even supporting there are people who are losing jobs, of course, from the crisis and, you know, what type of supports are given particularly for non-standard workers and women make uh, a particular large um, 
share of those uh, non-standard uh, workers. So, you know, ways for providing easier access to benefits targeted particularly to the more vulnerable people, low-income families, uh, single parents, uh, which tends to be single parents family, which tends to be predominantly obviously, uh, you know, female when there is a single parents. So that is particular fundamental importance. I think we can also do more in terms of uh, um, in the context of crisis, like this one, having a more tools for a gender impact assessments, uh, which uh, can be more, you know, strongly integrated into, into processes that, that we have. I think that's something that definitely would particularly, you know, help to, to, to the response. And so how do we integrate those gender uh, assessments uh, processes or tools into the emergency management uh, situations uh, um, in order to support more gender mainstreaming? How do we have even uh, gender budgeting um, mechanism? Think about now a lot of countries are considering fiscal, fiscal stimulus packages to uh, try you know, to encourage the recovery uh, from the, the significant economic shocks. And if we think about the fiscal st uh, uh, stimulus package, gender considerations and gender budgeting into that uh, would probably be important to understand whether we're uh, constructing a package that can help making uh, a difference to gender equality objectives, uh, for example. Um, and think about how, you know, can we have policy and, uh, and structural adjustments that uh, are needed in the context of the, on the crisis, but that can help more robust gender equity moving forward. So I think there are issues which, as I said, should be, um, you know, uh, considering the, the, the whole social protections uh, environment, there are specific things that can be done. Uh, in the crisis and particularly integrated that uh, gender perspective and impact assessment seems to be a quite, a quite important uh, uh, one to go forward. And Francesca, I'm going to actually ask Claire to react to that. So there's some um, key recommendations Francesca has mentioned, having uh, gender impact assessments, having gender lens budgeting, um, and also thinking about integrating uh, gender aspects into the fiscal uh, packets that are being put in. And again, I'm just summarizing some points. Claire, how do you um, see that fitting into the definition of gender responsive approach? Absolutely, I, I agree. I think you know we we don't do enough to to track this. We don't have enough data on the gendered impacts because it's often not considered or not considered to after until afterwards. Certainly, with the Ebola outbreak and the Zika outbreak, data didn't start being collected about the uh, gendered effects and the kind of secondary effects on women until after the crises were over. So we weren't able to react in real time. And so we need to make sure that data is collected and that data is sex segregated and not just the epidemiological data, which I think is also vitally important and we don't see enough of, but also all the data around, uh, you know, um, unemployment data, furlough data, uh, you know, who's accessing healthcare when you know, all data should be sex segregated so we can really understand the problem and in real time. And then the second part, which is also important, is, that, is there a budget line for this? Right, because obviously everything costs money, and outbreaks, like any other health decision, is in a you know constrained financial setting. So we need to make sure that there is a line of money being able to be to implement any interventions to try and reduce some of these. Um, and you know, how do we guarantee that and ring fence that budget line uh, in crisis decision making, so that we always know we have a certain amount of percentage which is going to go towards gendered issues, and that should be vital. But those aren't going to come in. That need for data collection and that need for a budget line isn't going to come in until the political will is there to put it there, right? Because the political will is about stopping the outbreak. And I think we need to push and hold our politicians to account and our decision makers to account to ensure that they, they make that decision to protect short and long term interests of, of women. Yes, I'd, uh, that's a great point about uh, the political leadership. So I'm, I'm actually going to turn back to Dr. Chan. And Dr. Chan, I had asked a, a bit earlier in the panel about, you know, one of the most sticky issues in global health is the unpaid work that women are doing in the health sector. And um, as you know, these numbers more, more than anybody, we, we are estimating 40 million health worker shortage globally by 2030, 18 million of that health worker shortage being in lower middle income countries. And yet we know 
that the health sector continues to underpay and even unpay women. So, you know, what type of political leadership is needed to uh, lead um, to this change? Because we know right now the house of cards can come tumbling down any time since the poorest women are subsidizing our health care around the world. Well, Rupa, I'm happy that you asked this question. The World Health Organization actually in 2009 sang the alarm clock. To me, it is deja vu. We are coming back to the same problem time and time and time again. 2009, we have the pandemic on influenza. And right after that, we have mers virus. We have Ebola. We have Zika. So what does that mean? That means the world is seeing more frequent health threats. And yet, and yet, all these wake-up calls were not strong enough to wake up political leaders to focus on the health and welfare of people to make sure that they have the health system capacity, not only to be prepared to deal with the uh, urgent crisis, but at the same time to have healthcare workers who can deal with the NCDs, you know, the family planning and maternal and child health. So basically the health system is a dynamic thing. It has to move with the context. What is fitting for the US may not be fitting for a country in Africa, but each and every country can evolve over time to be context specific, to be culture specific, but whether or not this time around COVID-19 is a much, much bigger wake up call, will wake up political leaders, will focus on people, people, people and people first and foremost, and focus on evidence and science. It's not rocket science to build a resilient health system. Because, you know, many NGOs, many organizations, many development partners are really needed to be supported with the funding. So going back to leadership and political leadership style. To me, I think, you know, COVID-19 begs the question, when political leaders go to the poll, they promise this, that, and others. And I fully agree with the comments from Claire and from Dr. Asim. We need to track their promises and see whether they keep their promises and hold them to account. When they promise the moon, the sun, and the sky, but they underperform. So if you truly believe in democracy, that is the kind of democracy we must have. We must have values, value people, and then the right to health and the right to life. And that to me is the most important for an individual. So I tell you, I've been in public health for 40 years. Yes, I look younger, but actually I'm not. <laughs> so friends, colleagues, this is truly wonderful, but I think it is about time. Doesn't matter what context you live in, doesn't matter which country you live in, or doesn't matter which political system you believe in, there is always a mechanism to hold the leadership to account. Make sure they do not keep, break the social contract with their people. So I, I think I will close at that. I'll leave it there. Yeah, th th thank you, Dr. Chan. And you know, 
you're right, COVID-19 is a global wake-up call. It's a global wake-up call to build back better. But as you said, it's also the time to uh, remind what, everyone of what the social contract is. A lot of what we've been asking for in gender equality is nothing new. These commitments have been made, um, if not decades before, but centuries before, particularly around um, gender equality and now more importantly around universal health coverage. Um, so as we wrap up this session and time has really um, you know, come quite quickly. I'm actually going to, you know, kick off with asking Claire and work our way um, backwards with our panelists. Really the closing, you know, final takeaway message, a take home action that you would like all of us to take as we really call for this new social contract in building back better in COVID-19 and beyond. Uh, so Claire, to you, please. Thanks, Rupa. Well, I think my, my one um, plea would be for uh, whoever you are in the global health policy space to ask the question, where are the women? And is the policy that I am creating inclusive? And does it recognize how women are affected differently to men? And obviously all other marginalized groups as well. But it's useful to ask that question and then you can understand how different groups might be affected. And this should be from the you know, top down all the way down to kind of local level responses. How can we ensure that our policy is you know, gender mainstreamed and how can we ensure that it recognizes these differential effects in the way that we create policy. And I'm also delighted today to uh, announce that uh, with, with Women in Global Health and my research group, Gender and COVID group, we are launching a new uh, policy brief this morning, which is really trying to provide guidance for uh, the, internet, uh, for the uh, independent panel and the WHO uh, review panel for the international health regulations for how we could, for example, mainstream gender into the international health regulations. We find that if, in, if we think about responding to outbreaks and you know, the IHR really are the core policy tool that we have globally to respond to outbreaks, but we don't think that they go far enough to consider women. Indeed, women are only mentioned in relation to travel advisories and making sure that they are, are not, um, uh, uh, they are, they are not, um, oh, my mind's got completely blank. Uh, they, 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 that women are not differentially affected in travel restrictions but also in the IHR review committee, we, we see a call for ensuring gender parity. But for example, we don't see gender parity requests in the emergency committee of the international health regulations. We don't see women and the differential effects on women uh, expressly called for in the international health regulation or risk assessments done by countries to ensure that women aren't going to be disproportionately affected by policies introduced. And so we will be widely sharing this policy brief and we, we you know, simply ask the government and the WHO to consider these requests to try and make the key tool of global health policy for responding to outbreaks more gender inclusive. Great, thank you, Claire, really appreciate that. Um, to you, IC. I just want to add that uh, in addition and you know, beyond you know, all the niceties about you know uh, inclusions and empowerment and support and all of that. Well, I would also like to say that frankly, you know, the uh, involvement of women in the response and their involvement in leadership positions, including in humanitarian setting, is is really not a favor. You know that one is doing to women. You know, sometimes it is just for selfish reasons. You know of an effective response. So it is the right thing to do. And I think we need to put that also back in perspective. That you know the work you know, around gender and inclusion should not be seen you know as a favor. You know towards you know but you know a right thing to do. You know for an effective response that is serving us all. And also, finally, you know, one of our uh, senior colleagues, you know, responded. I think posted in the chat as well as Simone and Frida about the need to also to uh, keep an eye, you know, on you know the uh, effective crisis response, you know, that we need to do fast and you know not to delay because of the long-term you know development discussions. And finally, you know, as we said in the first report of for the GPMB. We need to get out of this cycle of panic and neglect, you know, that leaders, you know, find themselves in. You panic when there is a shock and hazard, when it subsides, you know, we go back to business as usual, and then we go to sleep until the next shock and a hazard come in. I think we need here to work across a continuum, a continuum of preparedness, 
response. And when we respond, we make sure we invest enough in people and in communities so that they're able to withstand the next shock when it comes you know, next time around. Because for sure, the next shock and hazard will happen. But the fact that it becomes a catastrophic situation or not will be depending on our level of preparedness and our level of response. Thank you, I see. And really clear message that uh, there will be future shocks that we need to be ready for, not just this one. Um, I'd like to turn it to uh, Professor Esther. Yes, I agree with Clara. The, the thing is, she's trying to get uh, gender equality in our committees. That that would help. And also try to push women training in the different steps towards improving themselves in this, these networks of scientists around the globe. So it's your turn. Thank Great. You. Very, very, very clear. Gen gender parity and having uh, a much more inclusion. Um, to Francesca? Yeah, sure. I mean, quite clearly, that the impact of this crisis is, uh, is not gender uh, neutral. Um, there were obviously pre-existing gender inequalities that must be addressed, but I think fundamentally we need to design more gender sensitive recovery package and policies. And that's where the attention needs to go. You know, how really to integrate that gender equality into efforts to recover and how also to empower women to be drivers uh, of that recovery. Um, knowing that of course that will require addressing some of those pre-existing um, you know, inequalities that I mentioned at the beginning. But I think there is an opportunity to really redesign the recovery policies and packages in a way which is much more gender friendly and sensitive in this very moment. Great, thank you, Francesca. And Dr. Chan, I know you said you already had your last word, but I still would like to invite you to the floor um, for any final takeaway message. Well, uh a lot has been said and uh, by previous speakers, and I fully agree with the importance of uh, gender equity. But I just would like to make one point. We, while we act locally, as in the case of Hong Kong is a city or you are in a country, doesn't matter. That is important. But not much has been talked about collaboration today. Of course, we focus primarily on uh, uh, gender uh, equality. That's important. But not to collaborate globally is actually part of our trouble. I mean, COVID-19, COVID-19 doesn't have to be this terrible. I see, you know, you remember when we were dealing with Ebola crisis, when the when president well, of a big country talked to the president of another big country, and they come together to really provide a response. So I hope to be able to, to see, um, even while we are in the midst of the crisis, we need to celebrate, coerce, and encourage global collaboration. Without that, we are not going to solve this crisis. Thank you. Yes, and doc, Dr. Chan completely agree with that message that global collaboration, solidarity, partnerships are critical uh, to the response and to gender equality. So I am turning it to my uh, co-moderator, uh, Sarah Hillward, to, uh, to do the very final closing remarks and the challenge to bring it all together for us as we continue to take on the challenge of women leading in crisis and making sure that the new reality is that we have a build back better, a new social contract where we truly have much more diverse perspectives included in decision making. So welcome, Sarah, to you to close us out. Great. Thanks so much, Rupa. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, this was uh, quite a distinguished panel um, and, and a great discussion uh, with many solutions presented. Uh, so I'm Sarah Hillware, Deputy Director of Women in Global Health. Um, and in closing, I'd like to summarize some of the key points raised today. Uh, so first, we need to move beyond representation and move towards true equitable decision making. Um, this includes ensuring that we are looking at the informal decision making structures um, that are that are happening inside and outside uh, the workplace. Um, and the second is that we need to have uh, political will. Um, so we need to ensure that 
um, our democracy is, um, is, is functioning in a way that holds our leaders accountable um, to be able to achieve uh, true gender parity and true gender equitable um, COVID-19 and, and pandemic responses. Um, three, we need to ensure that uh, women especially um, are, are prioritized um, uh, as, as well as many vulnerable groups, uh, as, as Dr. Chan mentioned, uh, children, uh, those who are at risk of trafficking, uh, the elderly. Um, so we need to design with them in mind upfront um, and, and not do that as an afterthought. Um, and the third point is that we need to ensure that we're looking outside the health sector as well. Uh, and that we're working across sectors. Uh, so um, especially with the issue of unpaid work that was raised by uh, many panelists today, including our, our moderator, Dr. Rupa Dutt, um, we need to ensure that uh, women's unpaid work is something that is also prioritized. Um, as we know that uh, you know, during this pandemic, uh, women have taken on uh, the, the lion's share of work, um, it, you know, especially uh, at, at home, uh, but also, um, you know, they're they're uh, you know really really not um, able to participate in um, you know many uh, many uh, decision making uh, structures um, out, outside the workplace uh, because of uh, you know this 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 additional this triple burden of unpaid work. Uh, so really looking at unpaid work in a way that is holistic. Um, and then and finally, uh, we need to ensure that there is a line a budget line item. As Dr. Winham mentioned, uh, everything costs money. So we need to have um, a line item for gender mainstreaming to ensure um, that it's actually able to be followed through properly. Um, so just in closing, I'll share a little bit about how you can get involved in the Women in Global Health COVID 5050 campaign um, and really, really advocate and uh, join the movement for um, gender equity uh, and, and challenging power and privilege uh, for gender equity and health. Um, so first you can visit uh, covid5050.org um, and uh, you can see, uh, you, you can read more about our five asks, uh, which are really surrounding leadership, um, health workforce, unpaid work, gender responsive health systems and uh, supporting women's movements. Um, and if you're an organization, you can make a commitment um, and you can also see the other 40 plus organizations and governments who've committed to our five asks and reaffirming action on SDG five. Um, and to inquire about making a commitment, please email info at womenngh.org. Um, you can also attend our COVID 5050 virtual action labs, each around uh, one of our five asks. Uh, join us this coming Wednesday as we dive into our ask number three around unpaid and underpaid work. Um, and also follow us on Twitter at womenngh uh, to learn um, more about the action lab and join us. Um, and you can also share our digital report. Um, uh, which can also be uh, downloaded on the covid5050.org website. Again, it was such a pleasure to be with all of you today and have a great morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you are in the world. See you next time. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, panelists. We really appreciate all of your time. Uh, let's build back better together. Bye.